So welcome to the first focus session on the design of a digital Europe. Uh, thanks for connecting. We had over 900 participants registered by Webex, so we were really happy um, about the interest that we received. And um, many more will be connecting from the live stream. So we hope uh, to see many of you and to have a lot of uh, engagement as well. Now you can see here on the screen the QR code to the live stream as well. Um, and for those in the WebEx, we'll also paste um, link it in uh, in the chat in case you have any problems with the WebEx. You can always watch um, the live stream and switch it. Um, the event is also being recorded uh, and it will be published on the ECB website on the program page after the focus session. Now, before we start, um, let me give you a few practical information. You're muted, so you cannot turn on your microphone during this session. This doesn't mean that uh, you cannot interact with us. So you can ask questions via the chat or for people uh, following the live stream and not in the WebEx, uh, you can send an email to digitaleuro.ecb.europa.eu. Um, to ask your questions and we'll try to address them. So after each of the sessions, we will dedicate some time to respond to questions. Now, maybe we have a look at the program for today. We will start with a project update uh, by Evelyn Whitlock, Program Director of the Digital Euro Program, and she will give an overview where the project stands. Then uh, we will explore the impact and the opportunities that a digital euro would bring um, to European market participants with Ulrich Binzal, Director General of the Market Infrastructure and Payments Directorate. And last but not least, we'll have Patrick Papsdorf, Senior Advisor to the Digital Euro Rulebook Development Unit, explaining the latest developments on the preparation of a digital euro scheme rulebook. We will then wrap up and end the event at around 12. Now I'm Erica Ricci, I'm the team lead of the Digital Euro Outreach team, and I will moderate the session today. Now, I think we can move to the first topic of the morning, the status update of the project with Evelyn Whitlocks. Welcome, Evelyn. Thank you, Erica. Shall I take over from you? Yes, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Erica, for the introduction and good morning to everybody that uh, has connected. It's a uh, it's a pleasure that you all take the time on a Monday morning uh, to uh, be with us and to discuss uh, uh, the digital euro. So uh, what I will do today is uh, give you a project update and then my colleagues will tell you a bit more uh, about uh, specific uh, topics. Um, we find it important to have you here, uh, as I will say also later and explain is that uh, we cannot design and we are not designing a digital euro in isolation. Uh, of course, the goal legislators have a very important role there. Uh, but we were also very close with all market participants to make sure that we uh, design a digital euro that is really appealing to consumers and merchants uh, in the end. So uh, this, during these two hours, we will uh, give you an update and uh, we hope also to have some interaction based on the questions uh, or comments that you have and looking forward to that. So let me now dive into the topic. So if you look on the next slide, uh, you will see two major events that happened over summer, uh, one in Germany and one in, uh, in France, uh, Paris as uh, one of its main cities. Um, so it was really a sporty summer, uh, as most of you uh, know probably, and I hope you have enjoyed. But actually, they have a bit more in common than only sport. Uh, and one uh, element is, is that for both, uh, if you wanted to buy tickets, you needed to pay with a non-European payment solution. Uh, it was not possible to buy those with uh, European means of payments. 
And this very nicely links to one of the reasons why we're uh, working on the digital euro. Um, let me go through the with you through the foundations of the digital euro, which you can see on the next slide. Um, and uh, this explains why uh, the the, uh, the ECB, but uh, actually I think all of us together are working on a digital euro. Uh, first of all, we see that we are living in an increasingly digitized world. And the digital euro uh, will help us to adapt, to facilitate and to strengthen. Uh, let me go through these three pillars uh, one by one. So what we see is, is that uh, the use of cash, although cash is uh, one of the main uh, products, uh, if I can call it like this, of the central bank, uh, and we are very uh, attached to cash and we're very supportive of cash, we do see uh, that uh, we, society, as, uh, at large use cash less uh, and less for doing payments. Uh, so uh, what uh, uh, we want to do with the digital euro is to make sure that we have this uh, uh, public good cash uh, translated also to the digital age, so that you would have a form of digital cash that is, like cash, universally accepted uh, throughout the euro area and also is complementing the current uh, means of payments. Digital euro would also facilitate uh, uh, the citizens of Europe because it would be an additional payment choice uh, for the euro citizens, which complements cash. Uh, it will get a deal tender status, so it ensures that you can trust that if you have a that you can have easy access to a digital euro, uh, because you can uh, approach all payment service providers uh, to ask you to uh, give access to digital euro services. While on the other hand, you can be sure that the digital euro will be accepted throughout uh, the euro area. Uh, and therefore, it's always an uh, available option for euro area citizens for all payment scenarios. And currently, we don't have this kind of means of payments. And the ones that come closest to facilitate these payments, both in the e-com space, in the peer-to-peer -peer, and in the POS space, uh, are uh, non-European players. And that brings us to the third pillar. Uh, we believe that it's very important uh, for Europe that we preserve our strategic autonomy and our monetary sovereignty. Uh, and with that, we need to be sure that we reduce our dependency on non-European payment service providers, not by replacing them, but just having an additional choice for the end users. And with that, we will also uh, deliver a platform for innovation. But because of its standardized uh, uh, standards that we will deliver uh, and uh, the reach through all PSPs uh, to consumers and merchants, it will provide a very strong platform for further innovation and competition in the European payment sector. Let me now go through the third uh, slide. Uh, and uh, say a bit more on the fundamentals, so the key design choices. As you might recall, um, we have been doing uh, the investigation phase, which lasted, say, from uh, October 2021 to uh, November 2023. Uh, and in that, we focus mainly on the design of the digital euro. Uh, I will only go through the, the main uh, design choices here. It's impossible to touch upon all of them, but I want to remind you that we published at the end of the investigation phase a rather extensive report on the design choices, which is still the foundation of the further work we are doing in the preparation phase. But let me go back to uh, the fundamentals. One important element is that the digital euro, as I explained also on the other slide, would have been European reach. We are focusing for the initial issuance of the digital euro on three use cases. So peer to peer, so like with cash, you might want to uh, pay uh, or to give your daughter some money, uh, or you want to pay back a friend if you have been uh, to a restaurant. Uh, now you can do that with cash, 
in the future, there would also be an option to do that with a digital euro and to do that then in a digital form. Um, we focus also on point of sale transactions, so really in store transactions, <coughs> sorry, and e commerce uh, uh, transactions in the euro area. Then under these uh, use cases, there are three important pillars. First of all, uh, when we did uh, an, a consultation before we started the investigation phase, it was made clear by market participants that privacy uh, in combination with payments is extremely important. So uh, the design of the digital euro has taken privacy embedded in its design. So it's not a, an afterthought, it's really uh, being included in our design from the start. Um, we have actually uh, uh, two levels of privacy there. Let me uh, say a bit more on that. So first of all, there will be an offline digital euro, which is another key design factor of, uh, of the digital euro, because it will allow you to pay uh, when you're in proximity of others in an offline mode. And that means that the transaction will not go through a network uh, like an online transaction will go, but really will be done between two devices. And in that sense, <clears throat> it will also come very close uh, to the level of uh, uh, privacy that you have if you do a uh, cash payment. Uh, so the only thing we would know from an uh, digital euro, uh, offline digital euro, is when you have loaded digital euros on, uh, on your card or your device, <clears throat> which is the same if you currently withdraw cash. Uh, and next to that, we, have, uh, we and if I say we, it would be the intermediary, not the euro system, would see that you would have, uh, again, uh, defunded uh, your offline digital euros uh, on your account. Um, so that's one element of the high level of privacy that we have embedded in the design. The other element that we have embedded is to make sure that the euro system would not be able to uh, connect any transaction to a private individual. So that has currently been fully embedded in, uh, in the design and a clear uh, request for the solution that we are building. Then let me move to the other point, because the digital euro would be uh, a public good like cash is, and therefore, being uh, inclusive and accessible is extremely important in the design of the digital euro. For that, we have been in very close contact with consumer organizations already in the investigation phase. And also, <clears throat> it's an important topic when we uh, discuss, for example, uh, further details and design in the uh, rulebook development group. Uh, let me mention a couple of inclusive and access uh, uh, elements that uh, contribute to the inclusiveness and the accessibility of the digital euro. So, um, of course, uh, there is a, an accessibility to all uh, provided by all PSPs, but we also, and we're very happy uh, that that is also recognized in the draft legislative proposal, uh, believe that it's important that in every country there is also uh, a, a PSP that or a public organization that will support you uh, if you need, because inclusiveness is not only about access to services, but also being uh, financially inclusive. Inclusive, sorry. Another important element would be uh, the digital euro app. So that means that you can uh, uh, always uh, uh, trust that there is a digital euro app next to the apps that are provided by the PSPs. Uh, and in this app, we will make sure that we pay additionally uh, and thorough attention to uh, include uh, <clears throat> features that will uh, help the inclusiveness and the accessibility of the digital euro. Uh, and last but not least, uh, it seems a small thing, but it's very, uh, it has been brought forward as very important is is that uh, you would always have the opportunity not only to work with a digital app on your mobile phone but also uh, to get access to a payment card last but not least i touched upon this already in the context of uh, privacy the offline digital euro 
let me mention one last important point of this uh, in um, uh, the design of the digital euro, uh, and that is uh, that the fact that it will also contribute to resilience. And the fact that it doesn't that you can do your payments while there is a, a no uh, network connectivity or not even electricity uh, will uh, make our uh, payment infrastructure more robust uh, towards the future. Let me go now to uh, the next slide. Uh, and that is uh, uh, giving you an overview uh, of the different steps that we are taking in the project. I've alluded a couple of times already to the investigation phase, which is behind us now, but really focused on the concept definition, technical exploration and uh, a design proposal. And then since November uh, 2023, we are working on the preparation phase. Um, and in this phase, we focus on uh, four main topics. First of all, that we want to uh, finalize a draft scheme rulebook. We start this work already in the investigation phase, but we will continue this work or we are continuing this work in this phase. Uh, and uh, later on, there will be an update given by Patrick Papsdorf uh, on the status of that work. Next to that, we are selecting service providers uh, in order to facilitate and to bring a digital euro to the market. Uh, the euro system needs to provide uh, some services, uh, for example, the settlement of the digital euro. Uh, and for that, we are currently in the process of uh, selecting service providers. Uh, and then um, we have two important elements as well to further learn through experimentation. Uh, and that is uh, rather wide range, wide ranging. First of all, uh, we're going to do user research. Next to that, we're going to do more technical experimentation uh, within the Euro system, but also together uh, with the market. And then last but not least, we will do other deep dives uh, on technical aspects. And then I mean technical aspects in the most widest uh, form. So for example, we have uh, done quite a bit of further work uh, on uh, the offline digital euro, which is really also technically very new. Um, but we are also working on the uh, uh, models that we will use to calibrate uh, uh, the holding or that could be used to calibrate the holding limits uh, that are proposed in the design. So this is more a technical economical uh, uh, investigation that we are doing. In November uh, 2023, we will go back uh, to the governing council and we'll do a proposal for the next phase, which will depend on uh, the outcome of the work we have done in the preparation phase, but also, and let me mention this, uh, of course, on the progress uh, that uh, will be made uh, in the legislative process on the draft proposal for the digital euro. So again, a decision to issue a digital euro will only be considered by the ECB once the European Union's legislative process has been completed. Let me go to the next slide um, and uh, give you a bit of an overview how we're working. So um, at the core of our project is the constant collaboration with all stakeholders. Uh, and we, uh, they are many. Uh, but we have grouped them in four groups. On uh, the left hand side top, you will see the European policymakers, uh, where it's really a joint European effort. Uh, in the summer of 2023, uh, uh, the European Commission uh, published a draft legislation for the digital euro, which is currently being discussed uh, by the GO legislators. So uh, we have recent uh, interactions with the European Parliament already during the uh, investigation phase. Our executive board member uh, responsible for the digital euro went uh, on a regular basis to the European Parliament and our current uh, member of the board, Piero Cipollone, uh, it has been committed uh, to do the same uh, and we will even go there uh, in the, the coming weeks. Uh, we also stay connected uh, with the Council and the Eurogroup, giving them updates on our work uh, and answering technical assistance where ne necessary, uh, uh, which is the same for the European Commission and uh, interactions we have with other European bodies uh, like the EDPA. Then, uh, 
next to the European policymakers, we have our market participants. Um, actually, we have uh, three, four big groups there. Uh, on one side, the end users, the consumers and the merchants, where we see a rather good support for the digital euro. And then on the other, well, on the other side, but uh, next to that, we have the financial institutions, which you can divide between banks uh, and uh, non-bank PSPs. Of course, next to that, there are more uh, market participants that are of importance. For example, infrastructure and technology providers with whom we connect via uh, a frequent uh, calls for uh, expertise. Then uh, on the right uh, bottom, you see the central banks. Uh, as we have stated in other uh, updates, uh, we are not alone. Uh, um, the majority of central banks is working on uh, CBDC, so we have frequent interactions to learn and uh, from each other and to make sure that we uh, build on best practices. And last but not least, uh, more and more we're reaching out uh, and try to reach general public. Uh, um, which we do via our communication, but we also frequently every half hour, a uh, half year, we connect with civil society organizations uh, through the channels that the ECB has for that. Then I come to my last slide and then I will stop. Uh, our progress so far, we have done a uh, progress update uh, just before the summer. Uh, but let me recap uh, very shortly what we have done in the first part of the preparation phase. So we have uh, been uh, producing a first draft of the rulebook, which was published at the uh, uh, sent to the rulebook development group at the beginning of the year for a consultation. Uh, we are very busy with selecting the providers for the technical components. So we did a call uh, for uh, interest, a call for application uh, at the start of the year. And uh, just before the summer, uh, we published the ITTs, uh, so which is the call for offers as the next step. Um, and then um, let me say a bit more on uh, the functional work we're doing. So as I said before, we're very looking in much more detail in the offline functionality uh, and also how to guarantee this high level of privacy, further detailing out this in the design. Um, and then uh, I alluded to this as well. We're also working on a methodology for setting the holding limits. Um, as you know, this is a very important feature in the digital euro design, which is there to ensure financial stability. And together with uh, uh, the market participants, we are making sure that uh, if at a certain point in time, these holding limits need to be set, that we all agree that the methodology really takes into consideration all aspects that are relevant. And last but not least, we will continue to provide support to the legislative process. Uh, for example, uh, we did an analysis on uh, the technical implications of multiple accounts uh, for the digital euro. And with that, I will come to an end of uh, what I wanted to present, but not without before leaving you with a bit more detailed uh, overview. Uh, but what you could see, so there are some things in the past, but also st uh, things uh, still ahead of us, which is finalizing, for example, the rulebook, uh, the sourcing, but also the experimentation, which I talked about, will start uh, in the second half of this year and in the, in the remainder of 2025. And with this, I will uh, really close. And as Erica said before, we would be open for any questions uh, or comments. Thank you very much. Great indeed. Thank you very much, Evelyn, <clears throat> for the presentation. <clears throat> We did receive a few questions in the chat, so thank you very much and keep submitting them. Uh, it's always interesting to hear what are the topics that interest you the most. So Evelyn, I'll start from uh, one of the first questions that we received from Carolyn Beer. Uh, she asks, what would be the benefits and possibly downsides of a digital euro over the European Payments Initiative with respect to facilitating payments? Sorry, can you repeat this? So what are the benefits? Yeah, what are the benefits? <clears throat> Let me. Uh, what, what are the benefits and possibly downsides of a digital euro over the European Payments Initiative for facilitating payments? Okay. 
Well, um, so this is not a question in general on, on the benefit of the digital euro, but in, in connection with the European payments initiatives. That's at least how I take... Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's about EPI, basically, yes. Yeah. It's very technical. Yeah. So uh, as we have said before, um, uh, we believe that the di digital euro would be uh, an additional means uh, of payment um, and a public good. So. Um, we will very much believe in the coexistence uh, of multiple uh, payment solutions. So we continue uh, to invest in cash and to make sure that people that want to pay in cash can pay in cash. Uh, and we also foster that it's important that there are multiple ways to pay also uh, uh, commercial uh, solutions. Um, what we actually hope for, uh, and EPI is in that sense a really very good initiative, is that the solution that we currently have in, in Europe would become more uh, uh, provided by, by uh, European providers uh, instead of non-European providers. So in that sense, we believe that uh, uh, both of them are important, both the digital euro uh, um, as a public good, uh, as a form of digital cash, next to the European uh, payment initiative. And there are some overlapping uh, uh, benefits that they uh, can bring. Um, of course, um, EPI still needs to, will then still need to grow, uh, but they cover quite a number of uh, European countries. Uh, so pan-European reach uh, could be there, but we believe that the digital euro could also provide some benefits uh, to uh, uh, payment solutions like EPI, but other, we also are very supportive of any other uh, a payment solution, uh, European payment solution that uh, is aiming for pan-European reach. And we believe that with the standards of the digital euro, uh, these kind of solutions could much easier get off the ground uh, because there would be a European standard implemented both in the e-com space as well as uh, in, the, in the POS space uh, that could be reused also for these kind of schemes uh, in either to expand their geographic reach or uh, their coverage of use cases. Thank you, Evelyn. Next question um, is from Bart Walterman, and uh, he asks, will the use of digital euro be free of charge for its participants? That's a good question. Uh, so if you look to the current proposal of uh, uh, the Commission, which is in the draft legislation, um, you see that it's proposed that for the citizens, it will be free for basic use. And what are the basic services are is also defined in the legislation, uh, but that would be uh, uh, well, to have a digital euro account, to be able to do payments, to be able to uh, receive payments, and also to fund and to defund uh, uh, your digital euros to summarize it a bit. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, merchant would need to pay, as they currently also pay uh, to accept the uh, 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 digital means of payments. So there will be a fee for the merchants, but in the current draft legislation, it is proposed that there would be a cap because there is the combination of on one side, the proposal to have mandatory acceptance and then on the other side, uh, to put a cap to make sure that this uh, uh, obligation to accept will not be uh, misused, um, which we don't think uh, will be happening, but it's good to put a cap to be sure. Okay, the next question is about central bank money. So Johnson Tse asks, is the digital euro a central bank issued by the ECB and only the ECB? Yes, yes. So uh, it, it will be like cash. Uh, so it will be uh, central bank money uh, at its core uh, and uh, a bit actually like cash, it will be distributed via payment service providers. Okay. <clears throat> so. One second, I read the next question. There were a few. <clears throat> so we, <clears throat> I'm sorry. We have Nicole Berend asking, what are the main challenges for the implementation of the digital euro? 
quite of a general question, but if you can give an overview, Evelyn. Yeah. No, so, so what, first of all, is very important before we can even think about issues is make, that we uh, make sure that, uh, uh, that there is a legislation adopted because, as uh, we said before, the ECB and its governing council will not uh, consider to uh, uh, issue a digital euro uh, before that uh, would be there. So that's a really very important first uh, step that needs to be there. Next to that, um, uh, we need, of course, to make sure that the euro system is ready uh, for for such a solution, which is uh, uh, in itself not something that the euro system has not done. So we have delivered uh, systems like Target 2 uh, and TIPS, but it's still a big infrastructure uh, project that uh, uh, we would need to do. Then, of course, the market participants uh, need to connect uh, in order to provide these services. There, the rulebook, again, is very important. Um, and then after that, when technically everything is there, it is very important to make sure that everybody understands what the digital euro is, how you can use it, and that we make sure that the digital euro provides benefits for the end user so that it will be taken up. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now we have a few questions from Monica uh, Schoening. So she's asking, is the government to consumer use case still considered? And the second question linked to that, do payments methods like de direct debit support the digital euro? Okay, so uh, yes, the government to, to consumer is uh, still uh, uh, considered. Uh, we don't mention it very explicitly, but it, because if you look to the to what you need to do for the design, uh, it's not so different from uh, a business to, to consumer payment. So that's why uh, we don't always mention it separately, but it's still very much uh, in, uh, uh, in consideration. And I forgot the second part, sorry. Do payment methods like direct debit support the digital euro? Well, the digital euro uh, um, will be having its own rulebook. Uh, and uh, Patrick will explain that a bit uh, a bit better. Uh, so uh, it will have its own rulebook, but as we have said from the start, and we are actively working with that with the market, we are of course looking to reuse uh, existing standards uh, as much as possible. And for example, uh, the SCT INS have been uh, identified as one of the possible candidates uh, for reuse, also in the design of the uh, rulebook of the digital euro. Great, thank you. So next question, we have still a few minutes, so we're shooting. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, <clears throat> of questions, which is nice. Um, Sarah Shore asks, do you think digital euro will reduce the reliance on card schemes like Visa and MasterCard in Europe? Yes, it's designed in a way that uh, we would be more uh, independent. Let me be clear. It will still be a digital euro will be introduced as as a choice. So it's in the end uh, to the to the end user, both the consumers and the merchants, which type of payment they they want to use. But yes, uh, with the digital euro, we really aim uh, uh, to have a real pan European uh, solution for the three use cases that I said before, um, which will also have its own standards. So in that sense, uh, uh, we will have a separate infrastructure. So we're also looking uh, to what that would mean for the point of sale, for example, where the dependence on the uh, uh, card schemes uh, at this point in time is very high, so that we can have uh, uh, less dependency there and uh, be more independent uh, uh, and trust that we have a payment solution uh, in case of need. The next question is on the legislative process. So Paolo Ravasi asks, what is the state of the legislative process? Well, um, there has been a bit of a, a, a break, of course, um, because uh, there was have, have been uh, the elections. Uh, but uh, so before uh, the, the, the that break, for before the elections, uh, the European Parliament had uh, put uh, together a rapporteur uh, with shadow rapporteurs uh, and they did a first report uh, just before uh, going on uh, uh, 
uh, election leave, I would say. Uh, and this is currently being picked up. Uh, of course, uh, the parliament has now been uh, uh, installed. So we're looking forward in the coming uh, weeks and months uh, that this work also in the parliament will be picked up again. Next to that, there is uh, the Council Working Party, uh, uh, which uh, works under the presidencies uh, that are there. So uh, the, the Spanish and the uh, Belgian presidency uh, have issued a report of the work that they have done. And currently, uh, the Hungarian presidency, presidency is taking over and the work will continue uh, there. Okay, I think we can take um, <clears throat> the last question on um, on privacy and anonymity. So we have um, a common good that digital euro will be fully anonymous in a sense of as cash payments. In that case, can we assume that a digital euro will be out of the scope of verification pay obligation? Well, let me say two things. So the, I've not said that the digital euro will be fully anonymous. Uh, the, the, the level of privacy will in the end be de uh, determined by the legislator. But in the current proposal, uh, even if you have an offline digital euro, you need to identify yourself uh, as, a, uh, well, as a person, as, as a holder of the digital euro. So that means like, like with cash, that if you open a digital euro account and you get a means to hold offline um, uh, digital euros or online for that reason, uh, you will still uh, need to identify yourself. Then, as said, uh, for online payments, uh, the level in the current, uh, if we follow the current proposal, the level of privacy uh, for online uh, on the intermediary side uh, will be uh, uh, actually the same as for another uh, um, online payment. So that means that the intermediary can do AML and needs to do AML and CFT checks. Sorry. Um, but, uh, and then there the digital euro is actually more private than current means of payments. Uh, the euro system will uh, not see all that information. So we will only get uh, a transaction information which will allow us to settle a digital euro, but will not uh, allow us to uh, uh, connect a digital euro uh, to uh, a private individual. Um, for off on offline, it goes even further. Uh, so if you do a transaction offline, nobody will be in between. It will be you, just you and the one that receives. The digital euro that will know about this transaction uh, but no not more data will be uh, delivered so with that uh, we believe that we really make sure that there's a very high level of privacy for the digital euro thank you evelyn for all these explanations um i think we can uh, we can move to the next topic in the interest of time um we can try to address some of the questions uh later if we have some time left and we have also seen questions on the rule book and other topics that anyway we we can cover cover in the next sessions